A year ago, the bodies of two women and a teenaged girl were found in a shed in Caldwell, the victims of murder. The suspected killer, the husband of one of the women, the boyfriend of the other, still has not been found. The sheriff believes he is dead, but the search goes on, the case officially unsolved. Today, Canyon County Sheriff Kieran Donahue on the importance of this case to his office and where the investigation stands one year later. Plus, the buzzsaw sharks of Idaho. Yes, this 30 foot long shark with the buzzsaw jaw once prowled the oceans of Idaho, the biggest predator on earth 270 million years ago. How do we know? The fossils unearthed in the gem state, including a brand new discovery. The importance of the latest fossil find ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. And welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. June 19th of last year, the day the victims of a triple murder were discovered on a property in Caldwell. A year later, their killer hasn't been caught or found if he's already dead. In cases like this, it's always important to remember the victims. They are 48-year-old Nadia Medley, her 14-year-old daughter Peyton, and 56-year-old Cheryl Baker. Investigators suspect 60-year-old Gerald Michael Bollinger shot them to death inside a Caldwell home and then hid their bodies in a shed. And the victims knew Bollinger. Nadia Medley was Bollinger's girlfriend. Cheryl Baker was his wife. Since last year's murder, Bollinger has disappeared. The last trace of him was left at a remote Wyoming campground where his car was found. Canyon County Sheriff Kieran Donahue has said he believes Bollinger is dead. But if he's alive, investigators say Bollinger should be considered armed and dangerous, and anyone who spots him should call police right away. This is still very much an open case. My guest today is Canyon County Sheriff Kieran Donahue. Sheriff, thank you so much for coming in today to, to talk about this case one year later. Absolutely, I appreciate it. So why do you believe Michael Bollinger is dead? You know, we have a lot of physical and forensic evidence in this case. In fact, we have a tremendous amount. Uh, but the fact is, it just doesn't add up in terms of him still being out there. The chances are, the percentages are that he, that he is he either died of self-inflicted gunshot wound He's died of, of exposure to the elements. Uh, our belief, my belief personally, is that he's out in the Wyoming Teton Bridger National Forest. The car, the way the car was found, the time frame the car was found, the evidence of the video evidence of when that car arrived there by the Forest Service in that area. Uh, things that were inside the car, things that weren't inside the car, lead us to believe that he is out there somewhere and that he you know, for whatever reason, maybe he was going to try to make his great escape or maybe he just, his remorsefulness got to him, but I believe he's out there today. And it would probably take a hiker or somebody to, to stumble really, across remains yeah. if he is dead out there. Yeah, it, it's going to, and really we're hoping that that does happen. If he's out there, we're hoping that a hiker, a hunter, comes across the remains, clothing, you know, so that we can pull DNA and mm -hmm. do some comparisons on the DNA. If we can get to that point, there's no question in our mind that we can, we can close this case out if any of those types of remains are found. Um, so is there still an active search, might not be the right word, but um, there's not an active search in Grand Teton, obviously, but right. is there that national keep an eye out, uh, BOLO basically nationwide yep. for yeah, Absolutely, there's still a, a nationwide extradition warrant for Mr. Bollinger, times three for murder. For murder. Uh, and so, and actually it is kind of a, there is kind of a, a search out all the time because we keep this thing present out there in front of the people, in front of the public. Mm -hmm. We're continually asked the officials in, in Wyoming and in Idaho in that, part of the, in that part of the region to be on the lookout and to keep it in front of people. We believe strongly that, you know, we have solved this case. This case has been solved. We know who the suspect is and it's unequivocally Mr. Bollinger. In our opinion, based on the forensic evidence, the physical evidence, there's no doubt in our mind, there's no doubt in my mind, this is our guy and he's the only suspect in the case. What remains is that 1% of, is he still alive? And is he not, if he's not there, then where is he? So I use the word unsolved, but right. really you believe it's solved, but mm -hmm. not closed. Exa that's a very way, good way to put it. This case is not closed and we're, and we're gonna remain open. This case literally sits on this uh, sergeant of the te detective's desk every day. And every day he's going through that case, looking for something that we've missed or waiting for new information to come by, uh, come to us rather. And sometimes it does. We, we run down every lead. We've probably ran down, well, we've run down hundreds and hundreds of leads in this case. And yet 
recently. There's been no nothing to, to kind of get us going in a direction where possibly he's alive. And no sightings. No sightings. And realize we have very strong partnerships with our federal uh, mm -hmm. uh, law enforcement officers. So we still also don't believe that, I don't believe he got out of the country, mm -hmm. and I don't believe he's, he's out of the country today. Why do you believe he is the killer? Again, there's, there are certain things we can't talk about in the case, but the fi this is the type of case, as, a, as an old detective, right? This is the type of case where you look at that forensic and physical evidence and the timelines. Brilliant how that all came together. And it's brilliant because of the work of multiple agencies, multiple people within our agency. We have three, a minimum of three different scenes that we investigated, including where the car was found, uh, the residence in Utah, uh, a vehicle in Utah, and then of course the crime scene in Idaho. So a, tr a tri-state area, but there was critical, critical evidence discovered and collected at every single one of those. And when you compile that together, unequivocally from a from a forensic standpoint it only it leads to one and we can't talk exactly those points sure. but I can tell you unequivocally that's our guy and we know how he did it and we just don't know why he did it so yeah and there were no witnesses obviously no. and that's you know where the answers aren't coming to the surface of right. course so what do you believe happened the day of the murders I, I believe that that Mr. Bollinger obviously was, was carrying on a, a relationship that was unknown perhaps to his wife at the time uh, and possibly that the the girlfriend uh, possibly did or did not know about the wife at the same time and this went on for some time obviously based on the information we have from family members and 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 researching it and I think what happened was possibly and these are theories right because sure. we don't have any witnesses I think possibly this thing came to a crescendo uh, possibly the wife shows up unexpectedly, uh, a confrontation is had verbally at the, at the minimum, and things escalated. And Mr. Bollinger, and again, I'm speculating entirely, Mr. Bollinger has, what am I going to do? She's going to do this, she's going to do that. And out of, uh, out of passion or a, the heat of passion, he, he kills one of the people and, uh, and then once that happens, this ball is rolling downhill and there's no way back. And then another person is killed. And, and the 14 year old. The 14 year old who really, ha what, what role does a 14 year old have? This is the most horrendous part of the case in my opinion. I mean, it's all bad, but a 14 year old girl, but you can't leave any witnesses. At this point, you're not gonna go away, gonna go away any longer, right? Mm -hmm. you're, and you're not gonna be judged any harsher. So this is the point where I can't leave any witnesses. And by doing that, in my opinion, again, he buys himself some time. And he bought himself some about time. About three weeks, right? It was yeah, about, about three two weeks, weeks for weeks. us, and three weeks before we, we got the, to the car. Okay. Yeah. Um, how difficult was that scene, oh. con considering how much time had passed since the murders? It, horrific. You can't describe it in words. You can't describe the, well, the physical side of it, the smells, uh, just the, the you realize we're, we're in June, it's hot, they're in a shed. Uh, so the physical part of it, that's bad enough when you have it. You're dealing with human beings. That's what I was going to say. That's, it's bad enough when you have a, a body. But when you, when you have three women and in this state of decomposition and realizing that these people have been murdered and left there, it's not just the physical thing that you're seeing. It's the entire, the mental side of it. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets to the, to, the, to the officers, to the detectives, to the forensic team, our crime lab specialists. You can't shut that down entirely. They do. They did a tremendous job, but then it's days and days and days of investigating that scene and then everything you brought to the crime lab. Yeah. And how frustrating is it, you know, a year later for yourself and mm -hmm. particularly the detectives and those working right in there yeah. and, and working with the families that, that there isn't that final answer? It is as frustrating as it gets because you know you've got a good case. You know you've solved this case and you want to give closure to those victims so those victims' families, and even Mr. Bollinger's family, who, in my opinion, are also victims mm -hmm. in this case. And so you can't get much more frustrating case than that, especially, again, we always come back to this teenage girl. It's a teenage girl, yeah. and she was killed for, for what reason, right? What did she do wrong and to deserve to die in this horrific manner? But the detectives were all very frustrated. Me as the sheriff, you know, ultimately, 
it comes back to my responsibility. I oversee all these teams, and I want, this, I want to have this closure. I want to be able to tell the public. I want to be able to tell that family and sit down with them and say, you know, sorry isn't enough. I, I'm always at a loss for words when I have a homicide that we're working and the family comes to me as a sheriff and says, why did this happen? I don't have an answer for that. And so it's very difficult, and for us, it's, in, it's probably one of the most frustrating cases you can have is, is something like this where you can't quite close it. And so, last question about this case. What goes on now in year two? Same stuff. We're continuing to keep it out in the press, we're in the media. We're continuing to keep it, especially in that Teton Bridger National Forest area. We want out, uh, recreations to be out in there. We want people to be on the site. The smallest of things, it could be a baseball cap. It could be just a scrap of clothing. We want to collect that if, this, if it's out there. Uh, if it's not, we want to continue with this nationwide manhunt. We want to continue to expand it uh, internationally because what if that one picture comes up on a, on a screen through TSA or somewhere at an airport? We have to continue to be on the alert and we have to be, we have to be continually ready to act, ready to act on that and get to the authorities wherever that may be. Well, best wishes on Thank you. closing this case and hopefully soon. Yes. Um, while you're here, I want to touch on another subject. Mm -hmm. You're serving this year as the president of the Idaho Sheriff's Association. Yep. Yep. What is the role of the organization? The role of the organization is, is, quick, is quite frankly to represent the sheriffs of the state of Idaho, right? And the sheriffs, as you, as you know, as the top law enforcement officer in any county. And so they are responsible to enforce everything that's handed down by the legislature. In terms of whatever laws are on the books, mm -hmm. the sheriff is very, very involved with that. So myself as a sheriff, as the president, I work very closely with our legislative committee and I work on that committee to represent the sheriffs and their interests at the state legislature. So when that's in session, we are there almost every day. We're certainly there every week and we're watching what comes through because whatever is handed down, whatever the governor signs into law, we're going to have to enforce that mm -hmm. one way or the other. And so, so it's a collaboration to make sure that you're all working together and communicating and everything. Yeah, and really to see, to make sure that uh, people understand that, you know, you don't just write a bill and throw it out there. there there's ramifications of anything like that. So that's one of the big aspects of, the, of my job as the president. And then things that are happening in different counties when you have, uh, in, in some areas, we have uh, situations in a county, well, we're there for that sheriff and for his personnel, to guide them perhaps in through our insurance, guide them through legal matters. And, and really, it's, again, you said it collaboratively, that's what this was all about. We meet twice a year minimum as an entire sheriff's association. And there's a lot of bills that we introduce to the legislature too, things that are very pressing to us, like bail bonds mm -hmm. bill or, or this trespass bill that's come up. That's not something we introduced, we opposed, quite frankly. But those are matters that is gonna affect every sheriff in the state. And whether you're in a large county or very small, mm -hmm. pop, small populated county, it's this, the law is the same. You've got to be out there to represent. And I just have a very short time left in this segment, but I did want to ask you, as, as the founder of the Man Up mm -hmm. Crusade yep. and your fight against domestic violence, a yes. uh, big event for you is the Caldwell Night Rodeo yep. coming up yep. in August. What do you have planned this year? You know, we're building up toward that. It's just a matter of making sure that the pieces are in place with the committee. They do a good job of promoting it, putting it out in the print media, visual media, and making sure people come in solidarity wearing purple on Purple Night to show that their solidarity against this, again, horrific uh, epidemic that we're in throughout our nation of domestic violence. So we can show solidarity and show people there is a different way. And we, how uh, tangibly does the organization help in that, in that we, effort? Right, in every community, and we're in 13 states now as a nonprofit, so we represent a lot of agencies, but we, we partner with the committee, we partner with the local uh, domestic violence shelter, and all the money that we raise in those communities, we give back 100% plus of those funds back to that community, to those domestic violence shelters, as representative of the Man Up Crusade and that rodeo that we're part of. And you just got back from Reno this last getting night. the message out. Yes, right? absolutely. They do a great job. Sheriff, thank you for your time. Thank you. I really appreciate, appreciate you absolutely. coming in today to talk about the case and these other two very important issues that you're involved with yes, as sir. well. Yes, so sir. So best wishes to you and have a good summer. Okay, you too. All right, take care. Well, coming up next on Viewpoint, it's a creature that could grow up to 35 feet long and had a lower jaw like a buzzsaw and it called Idaho home a long, long time ago. The ne up, up next, the story of an ancient shark fossil that was found right here in the Gem State. Come celebrate the holiday in style with savings at the July 4th sale at Furniture Row. Every dining table is on sale. All beds and bunk beds are on sale. All sofas are on sale. 
and save on every bit of outdoor furniture with special savings on Tempur-Pedic at Denver Mattress. Plus, get up to four years no interest. Don't miss the July 4th sale at Furniture Row, home of Denver Mattress, your Tempur-Pedic elite retailer. You are invited to the premiere of The Lion King at the Morrison Center, live on stage for only three weeks. Performances begin in October, but tickets are on sale now. Don't wait until it's too late. Get your tickets online at morrisoncenter.com for The Lion King. Join your neighbors, family, and friends for an evening of faith, fun, and freedom at the 52nd Annual God and Country Festival on June 26th at the Ford Idaho Center. This year's lineup includes international speaker Nick Vujicic from Life Without Limbs, also musical guests Unspoken and American Idol finalist Maddie Zom. There will be food trucks and this event closes with a spectacular fireworks show. To post your local event, visit the Idaho Events Calendar at KTVB.com. When you give your best to yourself or to others, it lifts up everyone around you. That's a Sevens Hero, someone who inspires us to be better. I love helping families in their hardest times. We share their stories so they can inspire thousands more people, including you. They were so inspired to see that somebody so little knew what it was all about. Come meet a Sevens Hero tonight on the News at 10. Welcome back to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. Did you know Idaho was once home to the largest predator on Earth? It didn't walk on the land, it swam in the oceans that covered eastern Idaho 270 million years ago. A unique and fearsome looking creature. The Idaho Museum of Natural History in Pocatello recently received the donation of a fossil of part of an ancient shark. The spiral of fossil shark teeth measures eight inches in diameter. You can see it there. It came from the lower jaw of a helicoprion shark, as it's called, also called a buzzsaw shark for an obvious reason. It's believed to have been the largest predator on Earth at that time. And there you can see why it's called the buzzsaw shark. It could measure as long as 35 feet. The fossil was exposed during a mining operation at the Monsanto mine in Soda Springs. The Idaho Museum of Natural History on the campus of Idaho State University is home to the largest collection of Helicoprion shark fossils in the whole world. The museum has dozens of them. I talked with the museum's senior collections manager, Dr. Mary Thompson, about the importance of this latest fossil find. It's extremely important. Um, there's about 140 to 150 of these sharks that have been found all over the world. And the largest collection, public health collection of them is here. And so it's going to add more information about these sharks and about their lifestyle. And it's coming out of a mine that we'd only had one previously found before. So it's just gonna add to our knowledge about these sharks. What makes Eastern Idaho a place to find them? Well, at the time when these sharks were living, um, Eastern Idaho was underwater. There was a large um, body of o an ocean, basically. And these sharks were living in that. And then the sediments that they're found in um, were very helpful in preserving these tooth whorls. That's what we're mainly finding is the tooth whorls. Um, in, the, in this phosphate, and that's what they're doing is they're going in and mining the phosphate, and that's during the mining operations, they're actually finding these fossils. How many have been found here in Idaho? We're now somewhere around 80, except between 70 and 80. We kind of lose count because every several months or so as the mining operations are going on, they find a new one and call us up and bring it into us. So this is a really unique looking shark. Can you describe this buzzsaw killer as I've heard it described with this lower jaw that looks as if it were a circular saw or a table saw blade? Sharks, mainly their bodies, even modern sharks, their bodies are cartilaginous. So usually what we find in the fossil record 
are the teeth. And that's what we're primarily finding with this shark are the teeth. Shark, modern sharks replace their teeth. They, they, if they lose a tooth and a new one pops in. So this shark also is ever replacing its teeth, but instead of shedding the teeth, it packs them into its lower jaw and kind of forms this spiral shape. And that's very unusual. Um, we see it in other animals, but we don't see it in any other shark. And for a long time, we weren't sure exactly how this, you know, sat in the mouth, whether it was in the lower jaw, was it in the upper jaw, was there one world, was there two worlds? And a few years ago, researchers here actually took a specimen, they're encased in rock, these, these tooth whorls, and they CT scanned it, they CAT scanned it, and lo and behold, in the rock were bits and pieces of the lower jaw and the skull, and we refer to that specimen as Idaho number four. It is from Idaho, and basically that answered the question of how this tooth whorl sat in the jaw and really were able to come up with how this whorl functioned and how this, this, this shark was able to feed. And basically it would grab its prey with that circular saw of a jaw, right? The, the, it would open its mouth and kind of get that in there and then kind of work like um, sort of a reverse chopping block. On the roof of the mouth, there's probably these sort of bony plates. And so as it, the teeth are on the, in the lower jaw, and it would just kind of crush those up against the upper, and that's how it would just kind of shred its food and, and then swallow it down. I just think that is so cool, and it's right here in Idaho. The public will get a chance to see the shark fossil when the museum's Buzzsaw Sharks of Idaho exhibit opens in October. Coming up next on Viewpoint, meet the newest member of the KTVB News team. Denver Mattress is celebrating America's birthday with savings. Right now, get a free adjustable base upgrade when you purchase Temper Cloud Lux or Temper Cloud Breeze mattresses from Temper Pedic. And get Eurotop Comfort at an unbelievably low price on the new Sunlight Eurotop mattress by Denver Mattress. Now, just $2.99. Come on in and check out all the great offers today during our July 4th sale at Denver Mattress, your Temper Pedic Elite retailer inside Furniture Row. Last October, the First Alert Weather Team gave you their winter forecast. Forecast suggests another La Nina, but not necessarily like last year's. They said last winter's snowfall would be close to average. It was. They said temps would be average to mild. They were. If they can predict Idaho's unpredictable winters, spring and summer will be no problem. The First Alert Weather Team. Create Common Good, a local nonprofit, presents its second annual Feed Your Soul Fest on June 30th at Cecil D. Andrus Park in Boise. The free community-based event features live bands, cultural performances, food trucks, and family activities. Proceeds benefit the food service job training and placement program for people with barriers to employment, including refugees, women escaping domestic violence, and veterans. To post your local event, visit the Idaho Events Calendar at ktvb.com. Meet Blue. Blue's not feeling well. The prescription? Generic medication. Blue wonders, do they really work as well as name brands? Yes, generics and name brand medications do work the same. Even though they may look different, generics have the same key ingredients. FDA approval is equally rigorous for generics to make sure they're as safe and effective as name brands. And Blue even saves some green, making him a little less, well, blue. Talk to your doctor about generics and visit FDA.gov slash generic drugs. Well, you may have seen her a few times over the last couple weeks covering stories for us here at News Channel 7, but I wanted to take a couple minutes to help you get to know our newest reporter a little bit better. She is Shira Matsuzawa. Well, she may be familiar to some of you out there from before she was on TV here. We'll get to that in just a moment, but first, welcome. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. We're excited to work with you, too. It's great to have you as a newest member of our team. So, um, what were you doing before? you came here to Boise. Right, well, I'm from Boise, um, but I, for the last 
seven years I've been working as a producer for NBC Los Angeles. So I was essentially writing and editing and producing for the morning newscast. And you worked on the, the weekend morning shows too as well? I did. I produced the weekend morning newscast. So um, I'm very familiar with waking up early, <laughs> although I'm, won't, I'm not doing that here right now. So <laughs> I'm going to get to get back in. onto a regular schedule. Yes. Now, as I mentioned before, some people here might be familiar with you because you did. You grew up here. You lived here for a long time. Okay. And um, so tell us a little bit about what you did here, uh, where you went to school. And sure. I uh, graduated from Mountain View High School and I grew up here. My whole family's here. Um, you actually moved here when you were nine months old. Right? Nine months old, yeah. So I consider myself an Idahoan. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's really nice to be home. It's really nice to be able to work in the community where I grew up and to work, work for the station I grew up watching. So. And is that what brought you back was your, your connections here? Absolutely. My entire family's still here. And so as much as I loved living in Los Angeles, I was getting homesick, you know? And so um, it's, it's really nice to be home. And I think you're probably already noticing that the traffic here is so much worse <laughs> than yes. in Los Angeles. I, actually, I came home and I was like, what is this? Like, you, you know, I mean, I mean, no, I'm not worse in a good than way. Los Angeles, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, but it's, it's definitely more congested than it was when I left Boise. But nothing so. like LA. No. <laughs> it's no. all perspective, right? Th that is true, yes. So what are you, what are you looking forward to mostly um, about being able to come back and cover your hometown? I think for me, it's it's the fact that I get to cover stories that really impact the community and people like my friends and my family who actually, it, it has a direct impact on them. And so um, I'm very excited about that. And then obviously just being home, <laughs> being with my friends and my loved ones. And so it's got to be kind of comfortable to be back. It is. It's 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 a homecoming. It is. It <laughs> is. And so finally, just what do you do in your spare time when you're not covering journalism and doing stories? Um, I really like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of a foodie. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's You're very favorite. honest. Yeah, okay. It's my favorite pastime. So, um, But that's it's probably my number one hobby. That's probably sad, sad to say, but <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, there's a lot to choose from around yes. here. So, yes. so Shira, thank you for spending a couple of minutes with us. And, and it's going to be nice to get to know you a little bit better myself over the next few years. And welcome home. Thank and you. And we're excited to work with you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you. Yeah. Well, that is all of our time for this week's edition of Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you back here next week for another edition of Viewpoint and tomorrow on today's Morning News. Have a great day.